I was educated at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts in the 90s, um, together with some of my uh, fellow students. Um, we formed this group called In55 back in 1994. Uh, the environment that we grew up in was very much uh, shaped by people that wanted to have a career as artists, who wanted to become famous, who wanted to get in the stable, as we call it, um, in a gallery. So everything was very focused on the commercial market. And I am not interested in becoming famous. I've never been interested in the commercial markets, and I couldn't see myself in that at all. And luckily for me, uh, some other people at the at the studies uh, didn't uh, or shared the same feeling. So we decided to uh, originally to create this lab, and we got a space in the center of Copenhagen uh, in this address called N55, the Nordic Architectural um, and we decided to, to start doing all kinds of experiments with art and public uh, life and so forth. Um, and yeah, I've never had many role models, but uh, if I had had one, it must be Bob Mr. Ford. I don't know if you're familiar with him. this uh, American guy who uh, who's well known for inventing the all industrializing the, the buildings of domes. Uh, it was very popular by the, by the hippies in the late 60s because it was a simple way for them to build like uh, extraordinary structures. Um, he, um, in, in the late 20s, uh, when the Wall Street came down, uh, he, was, he was kind of a wealthy person. He was living in uh, New York with his wife. His uh, wife's father was a well-known architect. And it all came down like with a big bang, and Fuller uh, had a depression uh, for two years. And after those two years, he kind of woke up again, and he finally found out what he wanted to do. He wanted to, as he uh, called it, use his uh, average intelligence for the benefit of mankind. And he only had one thing that he wanted out of it. That was to have fun while doing it. It's not a precise quote, but that was uh, the content of it. I've always been admiring that. A lot. He wrote uh, uh, a very inspiring book uh, called Manual for Spaceship Earth. Um, his idea was that we're all uh, sort of astronauts, pilots on Spaceship Earth. So what to do about the situation? Where, where do you want to, to steer in which direction and so forth? And that was an inspiration for us as a group. Um, <coughs> first, we, um, we did a lot of different experiments like uh, making an alternative uh, uh, sort of election poll at the Danish uh, election for the government. We made like a three-person uh, demonstration walking through the city <coughs> and so forth. Um, uh, then we moved in together after doing a lot of, we, we kind of got rid of the express itself and started to work completely uh, collectively so uh, we were never mentioned by names uh, in the project. We did, we did like 30, 40 exhibitions in this place. After a two-year period, uh, we moved in together in this uh, large business apartment in the center of uh, Copenhagen. Uh, it was still possible to do that at that point. We are now talking 1996. Uh, and we started to, uh, to work with art as a part of everyday life, meaning that uh, uh, we, we, we tried to rebuild the city from within by changing our sort of indoor environment and inviting people to relate to that. Uh, instead of doing uh, traditional exhibitions, um, we wanted to change the city uh, and the way that, that the city works. It's a, like a classical modernistic uh, way of thinking that uh, by changing the environment we live in, we could also change the way that people are thinking and the way they behave towards each other. Something I'm very concerned about. Um, whenever we did a project, uh, we would uh, make manuals. So if we made a bed, we would make a manual for that, and so forth. Um, this was uh, done, it was out of need because we had no bathroom, so we invented this uh, hygiene system, we called it. It's basically a bathtub and a, a, a toilet with a biodegradable bag in it and so forth, and a supply module. We would also make collective versions of this uh, and open it up to the public. So 
we'd have events where people would come to our apartment and take a bath and drink some of our very functional and very efficient uh, 55 drinks. Um, and we would invite other artists to work in relation to our everyday life and our work. Um, so they would come with their own uh, works, like one guy would come in and set up a brewery in relation to our hydroponic system that we developed together with a Danish engineer who used to work for NASA, developing the first hydroponic systems for traveling in space, the very first. Uh, and um, we made the system, built it from scratch, uh, that enables us to, this is Icoware at a very early stage, but we were actually capable of producing quite a lot of fresh uh, vegetables and fruit in indoor. We also made chairs like this. Obviously, there's a lot of lines back to Bauhaus, to uh, the style, to Wiesfeld, and, and some of those uh, early uh, artistic uh, movements that combines architecture, art, and so forth. I grew up with my father as an architect, and I grew up in an environment uh, where I was completely sure that I should never become an architect or a designer. <laughs> and I've been working with that within the realm of, uh, of uh, the art institution ever since. Um, Then we decided to move out of this apartment uh, and to create our own uh, frame around our work uh, in the city. We were very naive, so we thought we could get like a place to do that. And there's this uh, uh, small question of land and prices and so forth and permissions. So we started off just borrowing this uh, area from the Danish uh, architecture school uh, in Copenhagen at Bailey Harbor. Uh, we produced this uh, house. At this point, um, we were already we already had like a, uh, an extended career as artists around the world because for some reason we were. I've never been very fond of the, the whole art system. I hate the curator institution uh, from my heart. Uh, we, I, at some point, we even had like this uh, collection because. Curators would, would uh, be interested because we did something with, that was very different from the rest uh, and, and we never tried to invite them or something like that. They heard about it, they would come to our, our apartment to visit us and we would be invited to do be part of exhibitions all around the world so you could find our toilet in Japan and in the US or whatever. Uh, and that was obviously a way for us to make a living as well. At one point we had this uh, uh, collection in Petri uh, 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 you know the ones you use to grow like biological samples. Uh, Petri dishes, it's called. Yeah. And we had this huge collection of curator snot. So we would take the curator, serve a cup of coffee, and afterwards we would take samples of the uh, <laughs> like, put it into the Petri dishes, and grow it. It was quite colorful actually, and very disgusting. And we had this huge collection of curator snot. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we had some curators here. Oh, you have a group here? I'm so sorry. I'll probably offend the rest of you as well later on. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Um, so, but this is an example of like of financing the house because we were invited for this exhibition in Norway at some point, and they said, "What do you want to exhibit?" We said, "Yeah, we want to exhibit like a fifth of the house," and they would uh, finance production of a fifth of our house. Um, and that way we collected all the parts for a house uh, based on a fuller system we did for the Ford Rotunda in the 1940s. We just uh, did it uh, with stainless steel instead of aluminum, uh, so it's better when there's less fire hazards and stuff. And our goal was to build a house that would cost the same as a Volkswagen uh, a Golf in Denmark at that point, um, and that it should be able able to last at least for 500 years without any maintenance. So the materials are primarily uh, acid resistant stainless steel that would basically last forever. And this was the first sort of prototype of the house. The, the whole weight of the house is like uh, about one and a half ton. It's nothing. Uh, when you look at the uh, how large the area covers on the side. So we had to uh, to produce these plastic uh, containers that we could fill up with water in the in the uh, lower level of the house in order for it to, to stay there and not blow away with the wind.
we use this house for a couple of months to to like make a lot of uh, events together with other artists, like musicians, all kinds of different artists in public space in Copenhagen. Then we decided to build our own land because it wasn't possible to get any land, and we came up with this design. It's a uh, it's uh, very different from other houseboat platforms in Copenhagen uh, and the rest of the world because normally when you want to make something stable uh, you would use a lot of concrete or something or steel in order to make it really really heavy like a normal houseboat would weigh like 90 tons or something and this structure weighs about a ton so it's, it's nothing but what we did is we we divided it into like a lot of small cells so it can't sink even though like 10 of them would puncture and it would still flow. And you made sure that the, the wave energy would uh, behave with the structure, interact with the structure in such a way that the wave energy is transformed into turbulence between the, uh, the small cells in the structure. And it actually worked, so we managed to make this ultra lightweight floating platform that was extremely stable, using very little material contained uh, compared to other uh, household projects. We didn't ask anybody. <coughs> uh, we just one day we just uh, came with this platform. We started to build a house on top and rented a, a, a space. Uh, this is one of the most sacred sort of areas in the center of Copenhagen. It's a, a military uh, sort of marine in the background, and it's it's not a place you're supposed to build anything. We didn't ask anybody um, because it looks. Special. I think we were allowed to do it somehow. I made a talk at some point at the, at the municipality's architectural office and uh, afterwards I found out that two of the guys who was actually in charge of making sure that none of this was happening uh, had been inside the house for a cup of tea and they just decided that it was nice. So nothing had to do with it. A year ago I was in the airport in Copenhagen and I, I saw this enormous book about wonderful architecture and building. This legal house was in that book. So somehow you can get away uh, with doing things in public space that are completely illegal and strange if it's just sort of respecting the surroundings in a, in a good way. It's, it's a strategy that we've been using a lot. In front of the house you see a solar powered book, uh, boat made from the same uh, uh, structure as the house. Uh, at this point, we would use parts of the house to do other structures. This is like the, the way that the, that the diamonds are built, like the structure here emulates the, the way that the diamonds are, uh, are, are built. Um, and this is, we call this work uh, public, uh, um, public things. It's basically uh, all the, the basic functions you need uh, in a home, like the beds and shower, cooking facilities, uh, there's even sound and information dispensers, roll-out beds and so forth. Um, and we would show this around the world. This is at the uh, Boden Center. <coughs> this is in Holland. So it was this collective house without a roof, living structure. We were very interested in alternative ways of, of, uh, of creating a the sort of living spaces. Obviously it's in the Western world and it's just been worse since we started. Uh, a major part of people's income is, uh, is uh, sort of reserved for, for paying for a place to live. And it's quite insane in, in Denmark, like people would pay like two thirds of their income just for a place to live. And as it is now in, in uh, cities like Copenhagen, those money would basically end up in very large uh, uh, sort of financial institutions pockets uh, and the way that we did like the, the way we built like the, this first small house and started to live in it I, I ended up living in it for four and a half years uh, was that we were basically people, three people living inside uh, and we paid uh, at the beginning we paid 500 more that's uh, less than 100 euros a month so we had a lot of money to do other things and to invest in trying to create a better world instead of just focusing on our own needs. This is a su suspended version of the house with uh, hammocks with roofs and, and uh, water collecting systems and water tanks and showers and all these things. 
We also, we stayed in Greenland at this artist in residency and was inspired by the traditional Inuit culture um, in some areas of Canada. Um, in the old days, the Inuit uh, families would meet up with other families in the winter time, <clears throat> and they would build like uh, in a few hours they would be able to build igloos and under snow sort of passages between the igloos and form like a temporary community uh, that would last maybe for months and then they would uh, split up again. Uh, we were inspired by that sort of nomadic way of living and we uh, made this snail shield system. It's basically a complete house uh, that also floats. Uh, inside that box is uh, like a vacuum cleaner, cooking facilities, toilet, uh, shower, everything you need in order to maintain an everyday life. It's easy to park. <laughs> you can fall by community practice. We did a lot of research in extreme housing. This is uh, my first attempt to build like an alternative transport system. I grew up with legal, it's quite obvious. Uh, the idea was that, um, that you'd be able to use your house as a, as a sales, a street sale uh, bike as well, uh, to have like a mobile restaurant where you used to be like a farmer uh, using these modular structures. Then we made the micro dwelling system. We wanted to make a system that would both work uh, on land, floating, and um, and submerged. Uh, it's using basic ship technology, so it's like basically just plates welded together. It's a space building structure. You can see the model standing on the table here. That it will fill up space completely, so you can build like very large structures using this uh, system. It's an extremely cheap way of building because like building ships in this size is very cheap. This is that. I lived there for a month, so I think it's uh, in the center of London, in front of the museum. We had a fantastic party for a long time. I said there was an outdoor uh, sort of shower that I was using, and there was like a, a very honorable, uh, the first English astronaut was visiting the exhibition at some point, and I talked to him, and he'd actually been seeing me taking a shower without anything, any clothes on, and he was quite, he was quite, uh, <coughs> yeah. This is the underwater water version. It's actually still in the Copenhagen power. This is a different, uh, it's actually the basis of the politics of N55. We work together with a Danish philosopher, um, and it's based on some of his discoveries in the, in the 50s. Uh, I'll make this story really short, what he proved is that, uh, that when we say that a person has rights, it's not something we can decide. It's uh, something you can learn from, from, from language on a very basic level, level. So my political stance and my political sort of way of working is always to try to find, uh, because of, like power, concentration of power doesn't necessarily respect the rights of persons, as you might have noticed around the world. So I would always be uh, trying to find ways of living with a small concentration of power as possible. It doesn't mean that I'm against the UN. I think it's a very important institution. I, I just think that the, the, the UN or the EU or whatever institution we come up with should always be concerned about a person's rights, first and foremost, and not about uh, the power of the institution itself. I think we could learn a lot from that. Uh, I also try to live my own life the way where uh, my power uh, towards other people is as minimal as possible. I hate the, the role of being a parent because I have to say, say stupid things to my kids. Uh, and I feel that I'm irresponsible if I don't do it, but I don't like sort of... I'm very concerned about uh, having power over my own life and I'm very concerned about not having power over other people's life. This is a much longer story, but it will take like a couple of hours to explain why this is important. Uh, another family of works is uh, more conceptual. It's, this project is called Land, and it's uh, basically a kind of kung fu where you use like the formal ownership of land, 
against the formal ownership of land. So use the power of the of the uh, whole concept of ownership of land against it. So um, we have this uh, internet, like part of our homepage. Um, you will be able to find different parts of the world. I think that's about 18 different spots in the world, stretching from the northern part of Norway to the San Diego in the US, uh, where people have promised that anybody could use uh, land, the area that they reserved. Uh, they promised that people can use it for whatever they want to. So it's a way of setting land free, small areas of land. And it's been used like throughout like the, the years. It's been used for like some guys built uh, a house in Sweden uh, on land. There has been like architectural conferences in Chicago on land, and it's been used for all kinds of purposes. I even met this guy who traveled to all the land places in the world, like uh, just to see and, and stayed there for a night. This is a front garden in Chicago. I've used the uh, parts of our house to, uh, to build this camp to mark that this is land and inside you'll find a manual for land that explains how it works. This is a uh, public artwork in Holland. Uh, it took like three years to get permission because they were really, like Holland is really uh, uh, controlled. They don't like doing things that they uh, can't predict what it's going to be. So um, after three years, they got the permission, but they wanted to make a can uh, canal around it, so it was separate from the rest of the area. It's now like in the center of like a, a new uh, city built in Utrecht, um, and it's been used for anything from like large parties to like a local sheep owner who is at his. Uh, Sheep's here, there's been like a uh, uh, allotment garden, all kinds of things going on there. Part of Denmark, Norway. We made a similar, this is, some of these projects is like a little bit archaic or anachronistic in the sense that we now have like Airbnb and stuff, but at this point there was this, uh, we, we always believed that we should always share what we did and make, uh, make it accessible to other people. So. Land was a way of of, uh, of making like a system where land would be accessible to other people, and rooms were a similar was a similar uh, project where people would have access to rooms. So it was a similar system where people that had uh, had extra rooms could make it available for other people to use for a period of time. This is a, a large barter barter shop, uh, but people could. Uh, swap things, they could uh, just take things that they wanted to, or they could uh, contribute with other things. And it started up as a project in Glasgow, uh, where we had like a 500 square meters uh, exhibition space. We bought these uh, old catering boxes from planes, like 300 of those, and we built anything like a public library, uh, health clinic, uh, uh, lecture room, uh, free restaurant, systems for growing food, uh, workshops uh, for all kinds of different things um, out of these boxes. This is a system for protesting that I'm not very proud of because I consider myself to be non-violent but there was a period where the police were extremely harsh to people in Copenhagen and they had these uh, uh, polycarbonate shields. I thought why don't we take like uh, the signs and turn them into potential carbonate, uh, polycarbonate shields so you take a stick off and then you have like a, a shield to protect you from the police <laughs> on the side. This is a system uh, for spreading uh, uh, information from higher altitude. Uh, I had an incident in England because the police was not very happy about it. It's a, an actual functional rocket that runs on the, on the laughing gas and polyethylene. It would go uh, about 50 kilometers in less than a minute. And I was uh, driving around in Copenhagen uh, this occasion, and the police uh, passed by me without saying anything. And it's an actual functioning rocket. It was built for uh, an event in uh, Sweden where there was about uh, genetically modified crops. And I had a fellow artist. He smuggled some uh, some weeds that I were genetically modified uh, so they could withstand Roundup. 
he smuggled it to Denmark for me, and then we put it into like small uh, containers, and it's in the rocket, so it's supposed to spread the information uh, at about five, five kilometers high, um, so that uh, you spread like super weeds that you can't kill with uh, with uh, with any kind of poison. Um, obviously, we tested the motor and so forth, but I never fired the rocket as such. Another example of uh, extreme uh, living system, this is a walking house. Um, I was invited to do a public commission in Cambridge, England, uh, in relation to the, the local Romani people living there. Uh, I have this uh, thing against using art as, uh, as an uh, excuse or instrument for not doing the social work that we should do as a society, and I don't want art to become like an excuse for that. So uh, after meeting these people and discussing the project, I said I can't do this. Uh, I don't believe in it. I believe we have a lot of social problems here that should be solved uh, with other means. Uh, and I offered to, to uh, come up with a, because I was very, during the process of research, I was very impressed by the traditional Romani uh, technology and the way that they would make, have these uh, carriages with uh, with living space for like six, seven people inside, really small, really uh, uh, like and really functional. Like they would even like the smallest kids would be like in drawers and stuff. Uh, and it was well insulated and worked really well. I was very impressed by that. Uh, so I said, what I can do is I can come up with this updated modern version of uh, of the system for nomadic living. Uh, and that was easy said and a little bit hard to realize. <laughs> I had some interns locally at this point from MIT and one of them had a friend who heard about this walking house and he offered to do the programming and was very grateful for that, he's called Sam Chronic. He became part of the project because I, I'm not that skilled in programming. Uh, it was a very simple idea uh, that I had to take a teacher head and, and make a system to change the length of the, of the struts so that you have the freedoms that you need in order to uh, make something walk like an insect. It's a simple uh, sort of geometrically uh, sort of idea, but it's very hard to do the programming after that. So it took like half a year to do the programming. This is, I was invited to show the walking house at the European Capital of Culture in the Ruhrgebiet in, uh, in Germany um, in 2010, I think. <clears throat> and uh, since I had a family and so forth, I asked Sam and some of my other American friends if they wanted to live in it. I lived in it for four months. So this is how it looks when people actually live in it. They lived in a park and they would walk it every day. <coughs> this is the interface, the touch screen, and you ask it to walk in a certain direction. It's not only the only walking house in the world, it's also the fastest. <laughs> it walks 220 meters per hour. <laughs> so we have, like, the good thing about this is it's really huge, like four and a half meters uh, high, and it's this enormous machine. But it's not dangerous because it's moving, it's moving so slow. So we had no things where dogs and kids were running around the legs and nothing like that. So this video is deliberately slow like a walking walk house, so I ask you to be patient. I wanted to work with wood, so it's actually a, a, actually a, a wooden structure with like metal legs attached to it.
solar solar power, that's uh, solar panels in the roof, and the large battery bank. And then there's 18 inner actuators that actually perform the work. cities with huge non-existing uh, uh, lakes on it and so sort of like collages to show the idea of the vision. Uh, and I thought why not why not make something that would actually work uh, and would work both as a, as a single walking house, as a, a walking collective or as a walking village or even as a walking city. So the computer system we've developed so it doesn't care whether there are six lakes or a thousand lakes, it will still work. And this is yeah, just a collage showing what a walking collection would look like. Another system of work, walking, uh, working with the like, proper space and how to use it. It's a simple dome structure. Okay, then, I mean, at, at this point of my life, I've done like about 200 exhibitions in 45 countries around the world, and I'm completely tired of, of doing exhibitions as such. Uh, it doesn't interest me anymore, and, and I'm really provoked by the whole sort of uh, so-called art world and how it works. Uh, I've been to a lot of exciting places, to the Venice Biennial, all kinds of things. Uh, I don't give a crap about it, really. Uh, it, what's really interests me is like the basic relation about of doing something in public space and see how people really react to it. Uh, and then go home and do something else the next time that sort of takes into consideration the things I've learned by, by doing this. So, I've been trying to find ways my whole career around the, the, the so-called art institution. Uh, so when I was invited to do uh, an exhibition in some, or we were invited to do some uh, exhibition at a museum, I was always asked to be outdoor in public space and to, like, to make them finance something that would actually make sense to me and, and be meaningful. Uh, at this point, uh, I met my former wife. Uh, my former wife was part of the project, uh, Engel, and she died, unfortunately, in 2005. 
then I met Anne, who's a, a very well-educated architect, now working as a teacher and, uh, and head of the bachelor program in the architecture school in Copenhagen. Uh, and I proposed to her that we should. Uh, that there was a Danish engineer called Tua Vesta, who was a very good engineer. Uh, he tried to make his. Uh, he was uh, working at the School of Architecture also. He's unfortunately dead now, but he was. Uh, trying to make his colleagues understand that there's a great potential in, in what you call pure plate structures where you, uh, if you look at like normal domes, it would usually it would be built as lattice structures so you have like the structural intent technically is, uh, is uh, created by having a lot of uh, struts connected together and then you have some cladding afterwards uh, but he, what he advocated was to look at things like the, the uh, this is a sea urchin to see how nature does it. So we decided to try to work with this biomimetic bio structure that we call the space plates. Um, and we basically learned as much as we could for a couple of years of how to, to work with this in 3D and how to, uh, how to translate it into meaningful architecture. It's interesting because you can create like the ultimate lightweight structures. It's almost like it's in, inflated. Um, this project ended up uh, becoming a greenhouse that you will see uh, a little bit later in a permanent structure in Bristol, England, uh, where you have like an enclosed space of uh, about 70 square meters. Uh, it's like four and a half meters to the ceiling at the tallest point, uh, and the wall thickness is four millimeter. And that's pretty extreme for a a structure like this. We did like a lot of research. It ended up in a, uh, like an article for this uh, scientific book about lightweight structures in a, a conference in Portugal or whatever. Then we decided to make a prototype um, at our own small uh, CNC barn. This was one of our volunteers, Tears, uh, interns that actually volunteered to try to uh, swing with the carrier. It's a three millimeter uh, construct, uh, structure uh, and it carries a load of, I could also be in the swing, so it would carry, carry like a 90 kilogram weight without any problems, you know, without any bending. Um, Then we got this commission to do this uh, educational room and greenhouse in relation to this uh, educational institution in Bristol. <coughs> and we designed it and we sent it there and we built it. And it's now looking like this. At this point, we also work with uh, our current engineer uh, and Bart, So it's like it's like now it's a, a three-person team um, working with developing this space-based structures. Uh, the goal is also to make insulated versions that could be used for like normal uh, living machines. This is another use of the system. It's a, it was a marine biologist and. In uh, Australia, who asked us to do an underwater house that he could use uh, for like three weeks periods in uh, Sydney Harbour, and he wanted it to be like a dive-in structure. So uh, at the bottom there's a hole, and uh, there's an ambient sort of uh, pressure inside, so you can always see the water mirror inside the centre of the of the house. It's only like four meters under the surface. It's now been delayed because. Uh, he, he got permission originally to do it in front of the Marine uh, Biology Museum in the center of Sydney, but it turned out to be uh, a, a habitat for like bull, sh bull sharks. And they were, they were, of course, concerned about the bull shark, but they were also very concerned about his <laughs> continued ability to live. So um, it's, it's a way now, I don't know what's going to happen. But the structure is there, and, yeah. So, uh, because I was so tired of, of uh, the whole art institutional system, I uh, tried to do like the, 
the space plate system and try to get art beyond the borders and into what could become part of people's sort of everyday life. Uh, I also needed to find like uh, uh, objects that were uh, not as big as housing. So I decided that cargo bikes would be like a, an interesting uh, uh, object to work with. Uh, I was a professor in uh, art and design, uh, as a guest professor in Hamburg, and I had an intern called Tim Wolfram, um, and I asked him if he wanted to be part of this uh, XYZ cargo project that was going to develop uh, bicycles, cargo bikes, for many reasons. Uh, uh, Denmark has a long tradition for building cargo bikes, uh, um, and it's therefore very, it's a big shame and it's very disgraceful that all Danish cargo bikes are now produced in China or in, in uh, Thailand. Some are, are produced in Vietnam, but it's always about finding low-income countries and, and get things produced there in order to optimize the profits. So we wanted to show that you can actually, if you find like an intelligent design, you could uh, produce things locally again. Uh, and you could sort of override a lot of the problems that, that you have when you send things to, to countries far away when it comes to the design. So we would typically, at this point, have like a, a week's design process where we would make 3D drawings, we would go into the workshop and we would produce it, and then we could, you know, a week later we could actually try out our new designs. So we have like this extremely fast, uh, very cheap process of developing new products. Um, one of the, the sustainability issues of getting things produced in China is that, uh, and I'm now quoting the Guardian, uh, the 15 largest container ships in the world, and I said one, five, 15 largest ships, they produce as many harmful particles as all the world's cars together. And these ships are primarily uh, occupied with going from China to, uh, to EU or from China to the United States. So it has like fatal consequences for our planet. It has fatal consequences for our local communities because we don't know how to make things anymore and we don't get the taxes out of the whole production sector. So who's going to pay in the long run for the schools, for the hospital, for our uh, so-called democracies? It's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous problem but people don't realize it. Um, there is some hope uh, and I really hope that, that people uh, in the long run, will understand the necessity of of not necessarily buying the cheapest uh, product, but buying something that is, has been produced in a socially and environmentally sustainable way. Uh, so, uh, what we did was to try to see if we could make a fair business, like complete idiots. We never had any business plan, so we we wanted to produce like locally produced uh, bicycles. We wanted to spend no money on marketing, we didn't want to take any loans, we just wanted to build up the production facilities and so forth ourselves. And we've now done that. Uh, Till has got a small... Uh, I, I offered Till to be become partner in the project, and it, it turns out that it's pretty motivating if you ask people that, to collaborate with you, if you offer them 50% of the revenue, they seem to be very motivated. So I, I've used that pro, uh, sort of principle ever after this. So, I always use that uh, because it's much more fun to work uh, uh, on this level with people instead of this level with people. I don't want to have employees, so I always try to collaborate with people. Um, but uh, both Till and I has got like a basic income from this project now. We're producing bicycles, we sell it primarily all over Europe, um, uh, and we have like a shitload of different models and so forth, and it works. We, the first project we made was this one-seater. Uh, it was made as a, it was financed by a public commission in Belgium. I was asked to make a public sculpture, and instead of a sculpture, uh, because it was such a beautiful place, uh, in my eyes, uh, I we developed this uh, this uh, one-seater with compact bicycles, and we uh, delivered six of those uh, to the project, so people could borrow a bike and, and ride it around in the in the area. It was open source in the sense that you can find the, the uh, drawings, the blueprints for it on the internet, and people have been copying it all over the world. Um, the rest of our models are uh, not open source, you're still allowed to copy it uh, for non-commercial reasons. 
purposes, but we, we don't facilitate it, so we don't give out the blue card for it. This is the two seater version. This is a design exhibition in Hong Kong. This is what comes out of people building it themselves. This, it hurts. This is our model, the model we sell most of. Uh, it's a basic uh, bike with a box in the front and the steering like a car, so the wheels will turn like a car. It's very lightweight, it's very strong. It's made from uh, anodized aluminum, outdoor anodized uh, aluminum uh, <coughs> with stainless uh, acid resistant uh, steel bolts and nuts. Uh, so, and there's like, uh, in order to prevent galvanic corrosion, there's, there's like polypropylene washers between the uh, different metals and stuff like that. Uh, and all this means that uh, you would have like a bicycle forever uh, if you maintain the bicycle path. So also, also on this level, it's a very different strategy from normal products because we all know that, uh, that they're supposed to break after a while. This can be transformed like a Lego system, it can be rebuilt, it can be repaired, uh, and it can last for a very, very long time. The, the, the basic principle of this is, uh, you know, it's not that visible, is uh, inspired by Riesbert, uh, the Dutch uh, architect, uh, who was a member of the style. Uh, he made this corner on a, on a chair uh, that's also known from, uh, from anti-tank uh, systems. It's called, a, it's called a Czech Hedgehog. It's a structure, that, a way of assembling things that uh, will supply uh, a decent level of structural integrity without uh, having any diagonals. And it makes it very easy to, to design all kinds of things and it makes it easy and, and possible for us to put the chain inside the frame. That's one of the things we wanted like a design level to create. Children transports. We sold a lot of uh, different systems for, for people that this is uh, from Paris. Um, it's a vegan uh, sort of hot dog <laughs> bike, if that even exists. But they, they, they bought a lot of bikes for that company, and these, these are the two owners. Another model, two in the company. Yeah, we have a small CNC router that we use to produce the standard parts for the for the for the standard models. Uh, meaning that yeah, when the robot does half the work, then it's of course much easier. This is the exhibition in Hong Kong where we produce this factory. So the first bike has got all the tools and stuff and materials you need in order to produce itself. So you see like new bike coming out at the end of the end of this mobile bike production facility. Crazy pizza baker in Copenhagen, but an enormous version of that. This is a company that produces uh, mushrooms from uh, coffee grounds. So they would use this bike to pick up coffee grounds from uh, cafeterias and institutions around Copenhagen. They would bring it to some containers at a certain area of Copenhagen and they would produce uh, mushrooms from it afterwards and then they sell the mushrooms. And it sounds like a fantasy, but it's actually a commercial success. I think it was inspired by a French project or something, but it actually works. This is another way of using the bicycle, it's called the Park Cycle Swarm. We were uh, approached by a, a group in San Francisco who invented something called the International Parking Day. Uh, they asked us to make a mobile uh, uh, park. And we came up with the Park Cycle Swarm. Uh, all the, the bikes are street legal in, in the EU. And what you do is you drive out with your friends and they meet up and make a park like this. <laughs> it works really well. You can fold in the, the steering and stuff like this. So you have a flat surface to use for whatever you want to. And yeah, in Copenhagen you don't, don't have to pay as a bicycle for for parking on the road, so you can actually take over the, the space <laughs> and, <laughs> and, 
um, and decides that you can do it like your own public planning in Denver. We are in, uh, currently developing our largest bike called the XYZ Cargo Truck, and it's really big. It's going to the limit of how big uh, bikes can be legally. Uh, into a project called Room Cycles, where we have like rooms that would allow you to have like your personal office or, uh, or workspace uh, and drive it into your preferred spot in the city, park it, or even meet up with other rooms and, and create like larger rooms. And the police can't do anything about it because it's completely legal. <laughs> Why are your bikes called? Sorry? Why are the bikes called? XYZC Cargo. Z or C, depending on whether you're English speaking from England, UK, or from the US. But yeah, XYZ is actually not the first. Cargo.com. If I like, look at the Facebook, we have like most models there. This is a recombinant version uh, that we sold, like, for, like, as an example, this spring I sold three to, uh, to this uh, uh, large uh, wholesale of fish that delivers fish to. Uh, uh, to restaurants in Copenhagen, he was able to take two cars out of his budget because he bought these uh, bicycles. Uh, he, he placed like uh, cooling uh, containers in the back, and guys are driving around on bicycles instead of cars inside of Copenhagen. He saved a shitload of money because of that, and it's good for the environment and for the city. This is the taxi version. This is a mobile kitchen based on the XYZ cargo truck. It's the same model that we want to use for, for creating this room cycle uh, thing. It carries like 250 kilograms uh, plus the driver. So it's actually almost like a small van. Allows you to do all kinds of things in the city. This is a, a project I did for last year for this uh, uh, large ex exhibition in Holland. Uh, it was a, it was about ecology and art, uh, and I basically placed the particle filter in, in, in the front of the bike. It's, a, it's ridiculous in the sense that you, uh, actually, I, I, I did some measurements and tests and so forth, and I found out that you can actually clean, uh, like, uh, uh, the air from uh, half harmful particles, uh, like, about 8 cubic, cubic meters per hour, if you drive 20 kilometers per hour. Uh, yeah, you would take like 90% of the harmful particles out of the air. So, but it, it's obviously it's stupid because the air just you know becomes clean air that you uh, uh, share with all the other people. But I thought that was a good measure to have something that was <coughs> like cleaning the air and you share it immediately. So it's, it's a bike with a particle filter. So you're not only using a bike instead of a car, you also clean the air while doing it and you share it with other people. <coughs> this is a project called. Uh, the XYC Open City that we've been using for all kinds of different projects. It's basically a legal system built on the same node points as the bikes, uh, but it allows you to, like, let's decide that we want to build like a bridge over this road up there, and we want to make, hang, hang hammocks inside so people could sleep under the bridge in a nice way, and people could pass over the, the road without uh, being killed by the car. Uh, and you would be able to like do this with the system in a few hours. This is from a, an exhibition, indoor version of another robot. But we've been using this system in the city in many places. This is from, uh, from Holland. All it takes is a lot of people. Carries the structures and build. This is a biogas uh, system that uh, TIL is developing together with an expert in, in biogas in uh, Hamburg. Uh, you know, it, 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 um, if you want to have time for a discussion, you need to uh, stop. I have 10 minutes more. 10 minutes? Or am I wrong? No, no, sorry. I thought it was like 10 minutes more. I, I'll do this fast. Okay. okay. This is a, something that still makes it like, uh, make me feel good about living in Denmark. Because every year, like we've done it for five years, we would uh, have like four students from the Copenhagen Summer University. They would come, we would build this ridiculously large structure that could only be carried by many people at a time. We would carry it through the city and place it in some place, like uh, the Danish parliament. 
And the fantastic thing is that you do things like this without the police or anybody else asking what you're doing. So we could just occupy this space in front of the parliament and walk away again. It's an ongoing project, what do you call the uh, um, urban space rover, public space rover. It's basically an autonomous robot that you can use to do things in public space. This is like from our local community. This is the very local uh, version of the bikes, me and my family when we were a bit younger. And this is the very global version of the bikes. You probably recognize this guy. Um, yeah, this is the project, I'm, one of the projects. I'm, I'm currently I'm working on the bikes, of course. I'm working on uh, this huge uh, project called Plants, uh, using our greenhouse system for uh, producing food in, uh, in schools in, in Florida. Uh, it's an American project originally, but they want to use our greenhouses uh, on a very large scale in order to uh, create like an icon for, for their project. So if everything works out, we will produce uh, like a lot of really, really big structures. And we have, at the moment, we are occupied with doing the calculations, simulations, in order to see uh, how the structure would work uh, with the hurricane problems and so forth they had in Florida. But it looks good. And we hope that it's going to work. Um, and this project is, uh, I was asked a year ago to, uh, to, to come up with a project for the Danish military. Of, uh, I don't know why I asked, but they did. Um, it's, it's, they're taking all the branches of the Danish military and then putting it under one umbrella. And the new head of command will be in Jutland, a place called Karl. Uh, and I took this structure that I like so much, um, uh, that's an anti tank thing, I made it really big, and I placed a swing in each of it with a peace sign in the, it's not as accentuated as it is in the real uh, version, but there's a peace sign in, in the, at the bottom of each swing. And I think it's about the only country in the world where a central military command would accept a swing set. <laughs> in front of their <laughs> That actually makes me a little bit proud of being a thing as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, so we have open some minutes now for you. <coughs> Come on. Yeah. Yes. The Perhaps uh, what you have been doing for several years, uh, you have seen the change in the discussion about the climate change, and also some parts of that, uh, you know, uh, easily leads to questions of survival, and survivalist uh, uh, fantasies and practices. And of course, we have these cliché survivalist somewhere in the desert of the United States hating the government and things like that. But then on the other hand, if the water is going to get higher, then uh, uh, we would probably need some kind of different methods of building kind of self-sustainable, uh, quite self-sufficient units where we could live. Uh, in Finland it would be that we would leave the shores and go up more uphill in the forests and, and, and some... How has these discussions affected your uh, kind of ideas and projects? Uh, they're probably quite, you know, it's easy to come up with, to have this discussion. And then at, at least in Finland we are now are overridden by really big public press about so, so the great public is much more aware of these options today than just like five years ago. I think there's, there's many levels of addressing the problems we have in the world. And, and one of them is, is to, um, to make extreme structures that make people talk about. Like I had like in the discussions when I did the walking house, I would meet people uh, and they would talk about how they lived in relation to a walking house. They would start thinking about the nomadic forcing versus the, the settlers and so forth. So like doing projects like this is also a way of, of raising 
the discussion and make it, making people focus and, and think out of the, the normal systems that they, are, they live in. Uh, I don't think I, I've come up with any solutions for anything at any point. Uh, I think I'm probably close to something that would really work with the bicycles because it's a local product that are extremely versatile, extremely lightweight and extremely good for the environment, both socially and environmentally. I think that's actually a very functional product, so to say, uh, and uh, also uh, as an art project that's, to me, one of the most interesting things I've done. Uh, but it's never been my goal to like, come up with final solutions or anything, but I've been very interested in the discussion. Uh, I think that the, the main problem we have is not to come up with new technology. We have like, all the technology we need from here to the end of, the, of time. I think the problem is the, the distribution of power. Because we never talk about that. I mean, the, the newspapers should be full of suggestions to have a maximal, maximal income. How can we accept the fact that some people are extremely rich and some people are extremely poor, even in Finland and Denmark, some of the most developed countries in the world, we have uh, an extreme division between rich and poor, and it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. How can you talk about democracy if some people have all the privileges in the world and enough privileges for, for thousands of lives and some people have nothing? So what we need to address is how we share without falling into old ideologies and mistakes and stuff. This is beyond all that because all our problems, overpopulation, environmental problems, social instability, Wars, everything comes down to the distribution of power, the distribution of wealth, and it's the only thing we don't talk about. We don't talk about that. And that has been like one of my main things. I didn't have time to come up with the more political, philosophical things here, but it's what I try to address all the time. In a humoristic and, and, and sort of positive way, because I don't believe in violence, I don't believe in or well, at least I think that violence might be necessary, but it's not my thing. I mean, uh, I think there's enough angry people out there, but, and sometimes uh, in my darkest moments, I, I fear that, that then there need to be like some kind of violent revolution or war for things to change. But I'm still hoping that it could be changed in a more positive way. Positive way. It can change also through catastrophes. That would also change things, but we don't like that. I would prefer people to, to find new ways of doing things that wouldn't uh, sort of require violence or catastrophes. But I'm, I'm, I'm not as optimistic as I was, I have to say. Like the current political development in some of the most uh, important uh, power structures in the world, like uh, China, like the IT dictatorship in China that is now like developing. Is very very frightening and scary, and what's happening in the, in the U.S. Is, is even more scary in some ways. So um, I think that what we all need to do is not necessarily to learn how to put like our waste in different boxes. It's more to find out how we share with the other people in a fair way, because we're not doing that. We're still basic, like our societies are still based on the repressing. Uh, of, of other countries in order to get the raw materials that we need and so forth. To get the, the cheap work from China, to get the <coughs> minerals we need for mobile phones from uh, Africa, whatever. It's still based on power structures that we don't want to face, but we have to face it. It's unfair, it's disgraceful that we should go, like we should be the first to make some changes in our own life, but also politically. Sorry, one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> what can you say after this? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, applaud. Yeah.